Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, subfields, whatever it is, it's a very, very, very biased collection. And today it's actually even more biased than it usually is, because I'm talking about one of my favorite fields, which is like really underrated, um, experimental mathematics. And it, it's heavily underrated in the sense that I wish, on, on my list, I have a long list of things that I wish I would have learned during my studies. This is very high on this list. Why is this very high on this list? Well, because in, in, when you start studying mathematics, it looks like mathematics is all about proving theorems. Um, but in the end, it's not. It's about coming up with conjectures or getting the right idea or doing the right definition, something like that. And having some class that kind of maybe not gets you there because that's, that's, that's very difficult, but at least to kind of gives you some hints how to get the right definition, how to get the right statement. Um, that would have been very, very, very helpful. And experimental mathematics is kind of a field like that. Um, it's a bit surprising that it actually counts as a field itself. It's kind of obvious if at one point in your life that this is part of mathematics, or part of life even. Uh, but anyway, it's a real field of mathematics. And yeah, let's, let's just explore it. And it's maybe more today like a kind of a mass philosophy type of video. Uh, which is fine, obviously. So, the point here is, and many people get that wrong, that mathematicians do experiments too. Whatever experiment really means, is, is like in quotation marks or whatever, it's not the experiment you usually think about. Um, so let me just see what my favorite, uh, my favorite academic, Dr. Google, thinks about what an experiment is. So experiment, so let's see, and it will come up, yeah, perfect. It will come up with those types of pictures. Yeah, so that's what people think is an experiment. Um, it's not necessarily an experiment. And in particular in mathematics and in, in life itself, you always kind of experiment. And maybe you have a heuristic how to go to some from A to B or whatever. And there are many, many famous examples in mathematics that came up from experiment. And by experiment, I really will mean here this, this quote of Paul Heimers. Um, yeah, so... Mathematics is all about trial and error, if you want. Guesswork, experimentation, computation, whatever that means. And um, this, well, experimental mass really came up in the computer age, where, well, calculations became more and more and more important, because a lot of calculations, you don't do them by hand anymore. And for some reasons, then people call it an experiment. When you do it by hand, people don't call it an experiment, which is a bit strange, should also be an experiment. Anyway, one of the most famous conjectures, the BSD conjecture, um, named after two people, uh, the Beers, Schwimmer, and Dyer conjecture, on the list of Millennium's problems, was discovered using uh, computer aid, essentially. So it's one of the most important conjectures in mathematics, although you might argue that the Millennium's conjectures are by now like 25 years old, uh, roughly, when you watch this video. Um, when it was posted, if you watch this video in a few years later, then they are much older. But anyway, so they're, they're quite old by now, and mathematics is developing so fast, so you might argue that they're actually not the most pressing problems anymore. And you might want to put something on the list like, uh, how, how, how can you mathematically explain the advance of AI or something like that? So maybe that would be a more modern list. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about the Millennium's conjectures. I just want to point out that one of the most famous ones actually is derived from experiments. And just keep in mind, mathematics is not about proving theorems. It's also about doing experiments, just in disguise, in the sense, as I just mentioned, whatever mathematicians mean by experiment is not the one that you just saw Dr. Google thinks is an experiment. Um, anyway, so here's a few examples. So what you can do, and maybe this is the most in my honest opinion, uh, in my humble opinion, whatever, in my biased opinion, is probably the most boring part of experimental mathematics, but probably also the most well-known one. Um, like search for large prime, something like that. Searching for examples using a computer. Oh, here's an example, a very famous MSN prime is something of the form two to the n minus one. And like, this is a difficult problem. So what do you do if you have a difficult problem and you can't really write down any nice statements, uh, you write down, um, yeah, you, you, you ask a computer to do it and this counts as experimental mathematics. And you can 
uh, think of similar things like computing a god knows how many digits of pi or something like that. It's fair enough. Uh, in my opinion, not super exciting, but a lot of people do it and it has some advantages. For example, it will eventually, because you need a lot of computational power, it will eventually kind of push um, well, well, computers, uh, or com our, our knowledge of computers uh, further. And then it's kind of worthwhile. Um, but I kind of feel like it's, as I said, from my bias point of view, the most boring part of experimental mathematics. And here's just this, well, it explodes quite quite fast, as you can as you can see here in this book. But the number of digits essentially double every certain number of years that you find in those uh, methane primes, right? And this is just one example of the tip of the iceberg. Searching for examples is a big part of experimental uh, mathematics. And there are just two gazillions of videos, articles, or whatever about here's a large prime number and this one is larger, something like that. Um, much more exciting, in my opinion, is the converse, converse in quotation marks, the search for counterexamples. So here's a famous one, which was found by computer uh, in the early days of computer, because the numbers you see down here are not terrifically large, they're just too large to do it by hand. But anyway, so um, Fermat's last theorem, uh, everyone knows that one, and the generalization of it, or kind of something that runs in parallel, is Euler's sum of powers conjecture. Essentially, it's the following. If you have something like this, you have three numbers. Uh, so this is a number n I have down here. And uh, you take the cased exponent. So this is a number. Uh, so maybe I should do it like this. This should go in blue. And now this is the number uh, k down there. Then n should be bigger or equal to k if these sum up to, uh, again, uh, a cube in this case, uh, a case power. So three cubed plus four cubed plus five cubed equals six cubed should imply that, well, in this case, the number of summons is larger than uh, the exponent that you use. And yeah, so this is something like Fermat's last theorem. You should expect this to be like really difficult and um, Euler wasn't able to do it. That already says it is not completely trivial and the computer found a counterexample. The counterexample is not terrifically large, as I said. It was a, an example from the early days of mathematics. But this is really a cool example of what experimental mathematics should do. It should kind of disprove your conjectures. Yeah? So whenever you have some, I want to prove theorem X, maybe it's a good idea to run a few calculations to see whether there is a, some counterexample out there and don't call it a conjecture immediately. I hope kind of doesn't make sense. I find this a bit more exciting than the search for examples. I should have find the search for counter examples. No? Um, but again, it's a matter of taste. It's kind of really, again, a crucial thing in a mathematics and you can imagine very, very different things where you can search for counter examples using experiments and experiments usually means nowadays some computer power, uh, some comp computer aided computations. Okay, and even better is the following, and this is a, an absolutely fantastic example. You can actually discover theorems using, well, you need them to prove them because we're doing mathematics, but you can still discover theorems using experiments. And this is really what I would have liked to learn at one point in my life, how to get the correct statements using some form of a computer instead of learning it as I go along in my uh, in my research. And here's a famous one. This is absolutely fantastic. I call it the theorem without words because it's pi equals something and everyone likes a pi equals something. And the something is actually pretty nice in the sense that this will converge very fast because you have a one over 16 to the k or something. Yeah, and this formula was discovered using uh, computer experiments. So it's a pretty, pretty nice example of how you can and for the next type of thing, instead of just searching for examples or counterexamples, you can actually uh, get proofs. No, not, but we also can get proofs. But in this case, you can get statements that you want to prove from experiments. And that is an extremely crucial thing you need to learn um, in life in general, even if you don't care about p becoming a mathematician or something. In life in general, you should have some heuristic, some method to get um, to kind of a statement type of thing you want to see true. Whatever that means in life, of course. 
Um, other things that I'm not going to mention is finding patterns, computer animations, computer visualizations. Absolutely fantastic. Very important in, in mathematics. Symbolic validation. Don't underestimate that one. Like you have a, a, a theorem and you're not quite sure because the proof is very sophisticated. So you maybe can uh, va validate symbolically certain special cases or something like this. Etc. 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 Right? Experimental mathematics is a really, really a large part of mathematics. It's crucial, and the reason I'm making this video, I think, it's a little bit underrated. You should not under underestimate the importance of uh, experiments in mathematics. And you can say examples instead of experiments if you want, if you don't like uh, the name experience. What also counts as experimental mathematics. And I'm a little bit more skeptical, but I really would like to call that experimental mathematics. But in, in, in just on the list, um, remember that experimental mathematics, or remember, let me say it again, experimental mathematics really came up in the 1950s, roughly, where people uh, started doing computer experiments for the first time. And then they put this one on the list, like computer verified proofs or computer aided proofs. It's on the list of experimental mathematics. I think nowadays it should be kicked off because computer verified proofs are actually better than human proofs. Uh, computers that usually don't do mistakes. But anyway, right now it's um, on the list. Computer can also do mistakes, but it's less likely. Um, anyway, so it's still on the list of experimental mathematics. Most famous one, uh, the four color theorem. Every map can be colored with four colors. Was posted in a letter a long, long time ago. Um, yeah, so took a while to be proven and uh, even up to this date, if you watch this video in 2024, um, the all known proofs involve large cases by cases you need to check and that's just breakfast for a machine if the number is not too large. So in this case it's breakfast for a machine and yeah, computer aided proofs also count as experimental mathematics but as I said, I personally would prefer to take that actually off the list should be an old field of mathematics, um, mathematics and computer verification, right? So that's, anyway, it, right now it counts as uh, experimental mathematics. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.